continuing in these Paul's church epistles. And we have made it to chapter number eight. This is lesson number seven. And we'll continue here this evening with the Lord's help. We would like to cover chapter eight, which is a, a brief chapter, a short chapter. And we would also like to cover all of chapter nine as well. If the Lord will allow us, permit us to do that this evening. <clears throat> And so we'll have to move quickly in order to do that. Uh, the problem that Paul is dealing with here in chapter number 8 is whether or not to eat meat that has been offered to idols. Now, the broader issue in view of this chapter here, or that's in view in this chapter, has to do with uh, the believer's liberty. And we'll talk more about that as we go along. But we do have liberty in Christ. We're thankful for that. But we should not use that liberty to offend our weaker brother. And that's pretty much the overall context of this chapter. And so we'll pray together and we'll look at these verses together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to be in church again tonight. Lord, it's been a blessing to be here. I've enjoyed the prayer group with the men. I've enjoyed the congregational singing. I've enjoyed our prayer together as a church around the altar. And uh, Lord, we've come now to the preaching part of the service. And I certainly do desire your prayers. Lord, that you'd help us to be a blessing to these, your people. And Father, we'll certainly thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse number 1, the Bible says, Now touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now, Paul here, he is answering, he's beginning to answer a question from this church about whether or not it is okay or acceptable to eat meat that has been offered to idols. Now, in many, in many religions, many pagan religions, these different animals were being offered and sacrificed under these false gods, these false idols. And uh, the priest then obviously gets his cut or his portion of that. And then the remainder was being sold in the temple or even in the meat markets or the markets, if you will, uh, to the common people. Now, the money that was being made from the sale of this product, of course, was going to this false temple as income. And so the question that Paul wanted to answer was, should a Christian eat meat or eat that meat that was offered to a false god? So verse number one says, now it's touching things offered unto, unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. Now we, we understand that the Lord told Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 and verse number four that knowledge shall be increased. And knowledge certainly has been increased in the day you and I are living in. However, we can certainly see that that knowledge has not uh, led to more people coming to Christ. That's for sure. It's led people away from God, if anything. So the thing in view here is charity that edifieth. We'll talk about that some more as we go along. Look at verse number two. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing as he ought yet. He knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Individuals or people who think, and I certainly hope this applies to none of you, that thinks they have it all figured out or that they know everything, they're in a great deal of trouble. And they're also completely ignorant of seeing themselves as God sees them. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're, we're not going to turn there. We're going to turn to some other places here in just a few moments. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse number 9, we're told that even believers know only know in part we don't we don't know everything we only know in part but when jesus returns we'll know about things as god knows about them according to verse number 12. i do like this verse concerning this a cross reference galatians 6 3 says for if any man think himself to be something when he is nothing he deceiveth himself and boy if we ever get to the place where we think we're something it doesn't take the lord but just about two minutes to bring you right to your knees and show you just how small that you are. And so when he thinketh he is something, he, <clears throat> if a man think himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. Look at verse number three. But if any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are offered in sacrifice unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world, 
and there is none other God but one. For though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or in earth, as there be gods many and lords many, but to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Howbeit there is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol, and their conscience being weak is defiled. So the city of Corinth, Corinth, we've talked about it before, was full of idols. And we certainly understand that behind every idol there is certainly a devil that is receiving worship. We know that, we understand that. But we also know that the idol in and of itself is nothing. Amen. It has, has no power, has no, has no uh, merit, it's nothing to you and I. And so a sacrifice of a meat offering to that idol is likewise uh, just as meat. It is not something, it is not something that has been tainted with devils and so on and so forth. And so Paul is making the point in this chapter that some of the weaker brethren did not understand this. In fact, they had convictions against eating this meat that had been offered unto these idols. And uh, so that is the, pretty much the context of what we're going to be talking about in this chapter. We know, Paul knows, and he's trying to allow these, this church in Corinth to know that any Christian was free to eat such meat, but just because we have that liberty to eat that meat, we are not to use that liberty to become a stumbling block to those who had a conscience toward this or a conviction against eating this meat. In other words, if you believe something is biblically acceptable and your, and your brother in Christ believes it is sin, don't exercise your liberty in front of him to offend him or cause him to stumble. And the Bible, in fact, the Bible says in verse number 12 of this very same chapter, it says, look what it says, but when you sin so against the brethren and, would, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. So if we willfully sin so against our weaker brother, the Bible says that we also sin against Christ. So we need to be considerate of who is watching our actions. Now, look at Galatians chapter 5 and verse number 13. There's a couple of verses here that I'll mention to go along with this. It says Galatians 5, 13 says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty, only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, I thought it was interesting. There's another verse, 1 Peter 2, 16, that says, As free and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, which we know to be ill will or active ill will, but as the servants of God. So here in both of these, in both of these references, Galatians 5, 13 and 1 Peter chapter 2, and verse number 16, it says that we're not to use our liberty uh, to please our flesh or uh, to, to, uh, for the advancement of the flesh or for the uh, enjoyment of the flesh, but we are to use that liberty to serve one another. We're, we got liberty. I don't think there's a whole lot of people that is interested to use their liberty to serve one another, and there's not a lot of folks who are interested in using the liberty that God has given them to be servants of God. But the, both of these reference said that, and so God help us to be willing to serve others and to serve the Lord. Now look at verse number 8. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worse. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Now, a Pharisee, we use that term, may step forward and say, well, I, I know that this is okay. I know that I have the liberty to do this. I know that it's all right. And I don't care what anyone thinks about it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Paul is telling us that is the wrong attitude to have. That's, that's what he's telling us in this chapter. Our knowledge, verse number one, or verse number two, uh, no, it's verse number one, knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And so our charity is to edify, our knowledge needs to have some charity. Verse number 13, Paul says the right, look at the right attitude, verse number 13, wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. 
So Paul's saying, look, this meat that is offered to idols, if it offends my brother, I don't have to eat meat that's been offered to an idol. I can abstain from that. I, while the world's, I don't have to have any more of it if it's going to cause my brother to be offended. Now, if you remember last semester, we was talking about uh, Romans. Uh, this principle of liberty is discussed in Romans chapter 14. We talked about it a little bit at that time. But uh, we're not to allow our liberty to cause our weaker brother to, stu to, su to stumble. We read that in Romans chapter 14, verses 1 and verse number 13. Let me give you a couple of examples. We understand that Catholics don't eat meat on Fridays during Lent. So if you're trying to win a Catholic and you invite him out to a restaurant on a Friday, I don't know why you would, but if you did, it would be, be a good way to witness to somebody. And if he orders meat, then you know it will be okay for you to order meat because he would not be offended by you eating meat. But if he wasn't or he didn't, I wouldn't either so as not to offend him. Let me give you an example that would be easier for you to, uh, easier to understand, one that would more likely apply, especially in the area in which we live or in the, here in this part of the country where we live, is what I'm trying to say. So you have visitors over at your house on Sunday afternoon after church, and the opportunity arrives, this good weather's pretty outside, it's nice, the opportunity arrives for you to go outside and wash your car. Well, if those people visiting with you are offended by you doing those kind of things on Sunday, even though you have the liberty to do that, it would be in your best interest to put off washing the car for another day so as not to offend your brother. Amen. So that, that's sort of the idea that Paul is saying here in this passage of Scripture concerning this eating meat that has been offered to idols. You are to have charity with your knowledge. Thank the Lord for the knowledge, but if you have no charity, knowledge does nothing but puffs up. Amen. Look at verse number 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in an idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? Now, this, this verse of Scripture says, if any man. So it seems here that this same principle would extend to the loss as well. Now, I'll tell you why that is. It is. It's unfortunate, but it seems to be true more times than not. It seems on many occasions that the unsaved often has higher standards and expectations of Christians than Christians themselves have. And that, that is a sad thing, but unfortunately that is the proves to be true the majority of the time. They have a, a greater expectation of higher standards of Christians than most believers themselves has. Now, the believer needs to be careful to maintain a good testimony before the lost and not to participate in anything questionable that might bring a reproach upon the name of Christ. Now, a good illustration of that is in Matthew chapter 17 where Jesus paid taxes. Now, as God, we certainly know that Jesus Christ didn't owe any taxes, but in order to maintain a good testimony before the world, he didn't put up an argument or a fight or resistance about it. He went ahead and paid his taxes. So the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22, to abstain from all appearance of evil. And so you and I, we ought to do all that we can to maintain a good testimony. Look at verse number 11. And through thy knowledge shall the weaker brother perish for whom Christ died. Now, in the context, the word perish here is not a reference to him dying lost and going to hell. It's to one's testimony in Christian growth. We, we want him to grow in the Lord. Verse number 12 says, But when you sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. So God help you and I to do the best that we can. Now, some people are just going to some people's going to be offended because you got up this morning. I mean, I mean, you you can't do nothing about that. You can't you can't help those type of people. But folks that are sincere, you ought to do all that you can to try to prevent from offending them. Don't destroy their faith. Don't destroy their confidence in the Lord. Don't destroy their confidence in you. Um, don't tarnish your testimony before them. 
who is your brother in Christ. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Now, in this chapter, Paul answers those who challenge his claim to apostleship. Verses 1 and verse number 3. Uh, it seems that there are some of the Corinthians who are not interested in submitting to his authority. And there's a lot of things actually here in, uh, in this chapter that we'll talk about as we go through the chapters. Really, only two topics in the chapter. And I want to say this before I get into this chapter. It's another one of those chapters. Um, I'm, <laughs> all of you that knows what the chapter is about, you know, it's that. This, this chapter is all about supporting pastors, preachers, missionaries. And so when I go through this, I'm, I'm preaching through the Bible. I am, I am, you guys are far better to me than I deserve. I'm, I'm not going through this because I'm looking for something or asking for something. We're going through the Bible, and I'm trying to teach the Bible, and that's what this chapter is about. I had the accusation the other day from someone that I had uh, preached about, um, um, let's see, what, what, what was it? What was the topic? Hmm. About gossiping. And I, I don't even know what they were talking about, but I'm thinking, man, I preach through the Bible. There's no telling. I, I can't even remember what I preach about sometimes because whatever's in the text, that's what we're going to talk about. So I wasn't targeting anyone. So evidently, somebody was guilty, and, and they thought I knew about it and was preaching against their gossiping. I, I, and so they were gossiping about it. But, but anyway, I... Uh, I'm preaching through the Bible, and chapter 9, the topic of chapter 9 is primarily about churches' responsibility to support pastors, preachers, missionaries, and things of that sort. Now, let me say this. The problem with the church at Corinth, or the problem with the church at Corinth has always been, all through the chapters leading up to here, selfishness. I'll, I'll do a very quick review. We saw in chapter 1 that there was division and conflict, and that was because of selfishness. We saw in chapter number 3, they were dividing one another into cliques, and were uh, all different kind of cliques and things were forming. That's because of selfishness. In chapter 4, selfishness caused problems because people with money were being uh, given preferential treatment over people who didn't have money. In chapter 5, there's all kind of fornication in the church, which is obviously an act of selfishness. And in chapter 6, there were lawsuits among brethren and disagreements that couldn't be resolved, and obviously that's because of selfishness. In chapter number 7, we talked about last week, there are marriage problems, and those marriage problems are because of selfishness. In chapter 8, these things that we just looked at, these arguments and debates over convictions rather than what the Bible actually has to teach is because of selfishness. So when you get to chapter number 9, the reason that Paul has to address the church of Corinth and their responsibility to be supportive of the church leaders is because of what? They're selfish. And so the theme carries on the same through the chapter. So in chapter 9... We have a, the matter of ministers and missionaries not being compensated or provided for. And as we've already mentioned, the reason for that is selfishness. Now, let's look at verse number one. Paul said, and we talked earlier too about them questioning his apostleship. He asked four questions in verse number one. I'm just going to go ahead and tell you before I read the questions, the implied answer to each one of these questions is yes. He says, am I an apostle? Yes. Am I not free? Yes. Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Yes. Are not ye my work in the Lord? Yes. Now, why is Paul asking these questions, or why is he referring to this? Why is he talking like this? Well, he's referring back to chapter number 8, the chapter that we just completed, and he said, do you, do you, Paul seems to be asking, do you think that I forego meat because I uh, I, I don't have the liberty or I don't have the, or recall there's something wrong with me. No, that, that's not why I forego meat. I, I did that because I didn't want to offend you. And he also, also, I think he asked these questions for this. I think Paul said, I want you to look at my credentials. I am an apostle. I am free. I've seen the Lord. And the fact that you are saved and there is a church at Corinth is proof of the Lord's hand upon my ministry. 
However, that does not excuse me from being humble and submissive and not trying to offend my weaker brother. And so God helped you and I, and even the, the biggest and the greatest, if there are such a thing, Paul would certainly fit that category, of Christians must humble himself for the help of another. I think that's what Paul is trying to portray to us in this verse of Scripture. Now look at verse number 2. If I be not an apostle unto others, yet doubtless I am to you, for the seal of mine apostleship are ye in the Lord. We briefly touched this just a moment ago. Paul said, look, the fact that you guys are saved is proof of my apostleship. The fact that you guys know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior is proof of God that God has honored my ministry. Verse number three, my answer to them that do examine me is this. So in, in verse number one, he seems to be, there's some questioning his apostleship. In verse number 3, it, we see that again. Paul said, my answer to them that, ex, do, that do examine me is this. In other words, there's some folks in Corinth, they're examining his life. But can I say this? There's folks examining your life as well. If they were examining the Apostle Paul's life, I promise you they're examining Tim Crotz's life and, and your life as well. And so Paul is under examination. Here's what he says. Have we not power? Now, I'm, I'm not cha- trying to change the Bible here. But it goes back to verse number, I think it goes back to chapter 8. Do we not have liberty, power or liberty? He said, have we not power to eat and to drink? Have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as other apostles, and as the brethren of the Lord and Cephas? So Paul's saying, look, do we not have the power? Do, Do we not have the liberty to lead about a sister? Or a wife. Now, we, we know that a Christian man, if his wife is saved, she is also his sister. And we know that. The Bible says this in Song of Solomon chapter 4. I've been reading Song of Solomon a lot and trying to study Song of Solomon quite a bit uh, as of late. But the Bible says in Song of Solomon chapter 4, verse number 9, Thou hast ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. So they're one in the same. That's what Paul is talking about. Would it, would it not be acceptable? For me to have a wife if she were a sister in Christ. Let me put it like that. That goes along with his other epistles. If you're going to get married, don't be unequally uh, joined together, amen. If you're saved, you should marry someone that is saved. Now, so he talks about a sister, a wife. Then he he goes on and he, he talks about the brethren in the Lord. Now, I want you to find Matthew chapter 13 for just a moment. I turned right to it. Praise the Lord. And so, uh, and then he mentions brethren in the Lord. Now, I want you to, in, the, in this passage of Scripture here, I am, I am fairly certain, in fact, I am sure that Paul is talking about the literal half-brethren of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, I, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. But here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 55, we'll see this, these four half-brothers of Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Matthew 13, 55, is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And his brethren, James and Joseph and Simon and Judas. Look, he has sisters as well, verse 56. And his sisters, are they not all with us? Whence then hath this man all these things? Now you can read that again if you'd like in Mark chapter 6, verse number 3. But Paul here, in this this passage of scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, He said, have we not power to lead about a sister, a wife, as well as Christ's brethren? They have wives. They're married. He makes mention of who they are. And then he goes on to say, and Cephas, now we know that to be Peter, and we certainly know that Peter was married as well. If I'd have had you to keep your place there, Matthew chapter 8, verse number 14 says, and when Jesus was coming to Peter's house, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick of a fever. So Peter had a wife, and uh, she often traveled with him on many of his trips. And so the fact that this is added information doesn't go along with the message at all. But the fact that Peter was married sort of nullifies the popes uh, saying that he is the first pope and all that kind of stuff because they don't even believe in marriage at all. They they contradict themselves. But anyway, so, so Paul here is saying to those that are examining him that he has the power He has the liberty to eat, chapter 8, or drink, and he has the power to have a wife, a sister, a wife, 
if he so desired to have one. Now, come to verse number six. Verse number six. For I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. Now we get into the context of the chapter. I want to say this. Now this forbear working, we obviously know that that means to give up working. And we certainly know, according to Acts chapter 18, that Paul was a tent maker. We've talked about that before. And uh, Paul knew he had uh, a right for the congregations to support him. He, he knew that. Now, in these following verses, these verses that we're going to read all the way down, I think, to chapter number, I'll have to look here to be sure, all the way down to chapter 23, I think it is, is going to be about the church's responsibility to support the leaders of the church. Now, I, I want to say something here. This is the only time that he makes mention of Barnabas. But I think it's really interesting. He said, or I only and Barnabas. I think it's very important to note here that Paul mentions Barnabas in this verse. Why? Because Paul's fellow labor in the gospel also needed support. And he, he said, or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working or to give up working. Now, Paul then makes it clear that though he could have taken a salary from this church while he was among them, he did not. I want to give you three reasons, and we'll look at some Bible scripture here in this chapter that goes along with this. Well, I believe that Paul did not. He did not take any compensation at all from the church of Corinth, and I think he tells us three reasons why he didn't do it. First of all, he didn't take anything from them due to their carnality and selfishness. Paul was afraid that because of their selfishness and carnality, it would hinder the gospel of Christ. Look what the Bible says in verse number 12, same chapter. If others be partaker of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power, but suffer all things lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. And so one reason Paul did not accept anything, any compensation for the church of Corinth is because he was afraid it would hinder the gospel. Now, we, we, I, I'm not against how anybody, I'm not responsible for how anybody, any other church operates. One reason, one of the reasons, and I've said this all along, that we don't pass an offering plate is because I don't want there to be a lost man sitting in the church and a stick an offering plate under his nose and expect him to put something in it. I don't want that to hinder the gospel. Now, the same is equally true. I don't want someone who is carnal and selfish think that the only reason we want them to be a part of our church is so we can stick an offering plate under their nose. Amen. And so there, there's a few. Now, I, now, with that being said, I go to the camp meeting. I help them take up money in a chicken bucket. Amen. And so I'm not, I, it's, I'm not against what other people do. I'm just saying that's the way we do things. Now, the second reason, a second reason, I don't think Paul took anything from the church of Corinth was due to their, their carnality and their selfishness. He didn't want to be appear that he was preaching just for money's sake. Look at verse number 16. He said, For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now, you know this, and I know this as well. We all need money to live. And I'll tell you this, money is not my motivation to be a pastor or a preacher. I can promise you that. And so Paul was afraid that because of their selfishness, he would appear to be preaching just for money's sake. And I, I'm certain, I promise you, there are preachers that are in it for the money but my name is not Joel Osteen, and I don't, I don't have jets and airplanes and mansions and all that stuff. But the Lord is really good to me, amen. I'm not complaining at all whatsoever. I need money just like you need money to live. Now, here's the third reason. Paul wanted a full spiritual reward from Christ rather than a monetary reward from the Corinthians. Look at verse 18. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Now, 
come back to verse number 6. He said, Or I only and Barnabas have not we power to forbear working. Verse number 7. One goeth, who goeth a warfare any time at his own charges? Who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof? Or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock? Now, the subject of paying the preacher is a hot topic among many churches today. And Paul goes about teaching the Bible's position by means of these three examples. Who goeth a warfare at any time at his own charges? Paul is saying, what man, what soldier goes to war at his own expense? Does not the country or the ruler for whom he is fighting pay for the necessary equipment and supplies for him to be involved in that war? Then he gives the example of who planteth a vineyard and eateth not of the fruit thereof. Workers in the field, workers in the vineyard, they have a right to eat of the fruit of that vineyard. He gives a third example. He says, or who feedeth a flock and eateth not of the milk of the flock. And so workers with animals, they're working with goats, they're working with cows, they have a right to the milk of that animal. Look at verse number, nine, uh, verse number eight. Say I these things as a man. Now, remember, they're questioning his authority, his apostleship, all through here. Say I these things as a man, or saith not the law the same also? For it is written in the law of Moses, Thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn. Doth God, doth God take care for oxen? Now, Paul here, he is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 25, and verse number 4. Where the Bible says just that, thou shalt not muzzle the axe when he treadeth out the corn. So when the, axe, the ox was pulling the machinery, the plow, the corn cutter, whatever, the, whatever they used back in those days, whatever work he was doing in the field, you were not to muzzle that ox. He had the right to at any time when he became hungry to bow his head and get him an ear of corn if he so desired to do so, you were not to muzzle him. So even the ox is entitled to partake of his own labor. The Lord cares for the oxen. Ain't that a blessing? Look at verse number 10. Or saith he it altogether for our sakes? Oh, he said it for our sakes. No doubt this is written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his hope. So Paul here tells us in this verse of Scripture very clearly that this is written for our sakes. So just as a man labors in plowing or thrashing, and in case you don't know what that means, it's talking about a uh, preacher that is uh, preaching in such a way, uh, maybe you'd call it strong preaching. I, I don't know what you call it. Miss Pam said preaching with grit. And so, uh, so he's talking about he's plowing, he's thrashing, he, he's preaching the Bible, he's preaching the Word, amen, and it's right to pay the preacher that would do that. He should be able to plow in hope, and he should be able to thresh in hope. If you're, I haven't started yet, I'm a little late. I may not even have a garden this year. Lord blessed us with so much last year, we don't need to can anything or put anything up. Uh, this year, I might plant some watermelons. They were really good. But uh, I, I haven't even started plowing at all. But if I get out there plowing and I put some seed in the ground, I do that with an expectation of hope that something is going to be at the end of that vine later on down the road. The preacher, the missionary, he has the same objection. He's plowing in hope. He's threshing in hope of something in return. Now, hold your place here and come to First Timothy chapter 5. 1 Timothy chapter 5. I know you're all really excited about this lesson. Verse 17. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially they who labor in word and doctrine. Why? Why? Verse 18. For the scripture saith, Thou shalt not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn. And the labor is worthy of his reward. So if you have a preacher, a pastor, a missionary that is laboring in word and deed, then his labor is worthy of reward. Amen. Now, you, now listen, now I know we don't have this problem here. Not that I am aware of. I, I know this problem exists. 
Because I, I talk to people all the time. They don't, they don't think you should support the preacher. They, you know, they think that he ought to work a job and then work a second job to be a pastor. And, and they're only working half of a job, but they want you to work two, so it'll be fair. But when he does go to work, he expects compensation for his labor. And the Bible said that the preacher, the pastor, the missionary, he should be compensated for his labor in word and doctrine. Amen. Now, come back to the second, or First Corinthians and look at verse number 9. He just goes on with this. If, you have sown, if we have sown unto you spiritual things, is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Now, the carnal things obviously would apply to money or a salary. A salary. And obviously the implied answer here or to this question is no. So when a pastor or a missionary, evangelist, whatever, gets out there and delivers the spiritual things, it is the duty of the congregation to provide for his carnal things or his physical needs. Now, I really like this. I, I really hadn't paid this any attention as many times as I've been through these uh, verses and chapters before until today. I think it's the first time I've noticed. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Notice the wording. Is it a great thing? It, it should not even be considered out of the ordinary. It's, it's, nothing, it's nothing that should raise a red flag. It's, it's not that, and it's nothing that you should be commended for. It's not a great thing. I, I thought about I think it's, it goes right along pretty much with Romans chapter 12 and verse number 1. I think it's your reasonable service. Amen? And so um, look at verse 14, same chapter. You in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, look at verse 14. Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. Now here's why Paul is dealing with this subject. We've already talked about the fact that Paul did not receive any compensation for this church. And I want to show you some verses of scripture in a few minutes where Paul is sorry that he didn't do that. Now I got your attention. But it's true. Here's why Paul is teaching this church now. He's been there, he's left there, he's writing a letter to them, and he's telling them, he's giving them this information in this letter that they should be supporting churches, and here's why. When Paul left that town, when Paul left Corinth, he had to leave a man there in charge to be their pastor, their overseer, and they thought that he shouldn't be compensated, he should get a job and work and support himself because that's what Paul did when he was here. And so Paul is, is writing to them to tell them that, you, you know, you're a, this local assembly that you have here, you are responsible for compensating the man who is there providing your spiritual needs and your spiritual well-being. He, he isn't preaching for money, amen. Paul said, we have sown unto you spiritual things. It is a great thing. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things? Now, here, here's what I was talking about just a moment ago. I think this is very important. Come to 2 Corinthians, if you will. 2 Corinthians chapter number, uh, let's go to chapter number 11. 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. Now, Paul is going to admit that he failed to teach the Corinthian church to finance the ministry, the minister. Look what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 7. He said, have I committed an offense in abasing myself that you might be exalted? Now look, why? Because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely. Verse number eight, he said, I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Paul is telling the church of Corinth here in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He said, if I have committed an offense toward you, it was that I preached the gospel to you freely. He, he goes on to say in verse, now I, I like this. In verse number eight, Paul said, I robbed from other churches. Now, Paul didn't, Paul didn't have a gun stuck in his pocket and he's sitting in the congregation and as soon as the uh, Christian and Miss Paula run to the office to count them up, he didn't go in with a gun. He didn't rob them. He said, other churches were supporting me I, so it's obvious that Paul wasn't against receiving support. He's receiving support from the church of Macedonia, 
Because this church at Corinth is so carnal and so selfish, he was afraid to even ask them for money because he was afraid they'd think he was only there for their money. But now he tells them, now he's telling them, I, you know, I wish I, wish I had have done that. He said, I don't believe that preacher. Well, look at chapter 12, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, look at verse 13. Second Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, For what is it wherein ye were inferior to other churches, except it be that I myself was not burdensome to you? Look what he said. Forgive me this wrong. So Paul said, if I did anything to contribute it to the church of Corinth, being inferior to other churches, it was that I did not allow them to support me with their financial means. Now, Paul carries this to come to the point that he, he asked them for forgiveness because he didn't allow them to support him financially. Now, come back to verse number 12. i got to hurry. I'm down to 15 minutes and got a lot of verses to go. Verse number 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse number 12. If others be partakers of this power over you, are not we rather? Nevertheless, we have not used this power but suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. Suffer all things. Paul here is now telling the church of Corinth that, that personally he suffered many things. He was short on money. He was short on necessities, necessary supplies. And he is suggesting that the Corinthian believers could have assisted with those needs, but they did not. I'm kind of wondering, wasn't there somebody in that congregation that came to the realization that this guy needs some help. But I guess when you're selfish, you only see your needs and not the needs of others. Now, I look, can we go back to 2 Corinthians one more time? I'm well aware of the time, and it's passing quickly on my part. It probably isn't passing quickly on your part. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look at this. Verse number 9, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse number 9. He said, and when I was present with you and wanted. Now, that's not that Paul wanted a cheeseburger. He, he's talking about some needs. He needed some things. I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the bread in which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so will I keep myself. Paul said, look, I needed some things. I lacked some things, some things that were necessary. And um, they weren't supplied. Now, unfortunately, there are still multitudes of Christians like this today. And I, listen, I, I am certain that there are, there are a lot of, of bad, lazy pastors. And I'm certain, I, Brother Jordan calls them moochinaries. I'm, I'm certain that there are some moochinaries out there. I promise you they are. But I also promise you that there is a lot of good men who have a heart for God and a desire to labor in word and doctrine and to share those spiritual truths with others so that they might learn and grow together in the things of the Lord. And amongst those good men, there are going to be some pastors who aren't worth shooting and there's going to be some moochinaries who are going to stand before God and give an account of their mooching. Amen. But that doesn't keep us from our responsibility of supporting the men who want to labor and work for the Lord. Amen. Now, come to verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 9. We've got to hurry. You're going to have to read faster than this. Chapter, chapter 9, verse 13. Do ye not know that they which minister about holy things live of the things of the temple? And they which wait at the altar are partakers with the altar. Now, in the Old Testament, we know that the priests and the Levites, they got to take a portion of each offering that was brought in. They got to take a portion of that for their personal needs. Now, Paul here in this verse of Scripture is specifically referring to the Old Testament wave offering uh, where the priests in the tabernacle or temple got, a, got to keep a part of the sacrifice made to God as a salary. Now, we're going to read several verses here, and we're not going to comment on them because we've already commented on them as we went through the chapter. But verse 1 to 14 says, Even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel, 
But I have not you, but I have used none of these things, neither have I written these things, that it should be so done unto me. For it were better for me to die than that any man should make my glory in void. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. For if I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, that when I preach the gospel, I may make, make, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Verse 19, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without the law, as without law, not being without law to God, but under the law to Christ, that I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And I do this for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now, these verses, especially verse 22, to the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Now, these verses are certainly not advocating that you sin or do wrong, compromise Bible principles in order to be a witness or to win somebody. That is not what these verses are talking about at all. It is never right to do wrong. Amen. Now, we should never use this passage as an excuse to sin in order to supposedly witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I like this as well. I got to say this briefly because I got to, to hurry, but I like this verse 22 as well. To the weak became I as weak that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men that I might by all men save some. This is a verse that is despised by Calvinists. I'll tell you why. It shows that man at least has some part or some uh, responsibility in the credit of salvation of lost people. Man, I like that. Look at verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Now here in verse 24, the subject matter changes from supporting ministries to running your own spiritual race. Now, we all know the passage well, so I won't turn there. But the Bible says in Hebrews 12, verse number 1, Wherefore sin we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witness. Let us lay aside every way in the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Verse number 2 tells us the finish line that we're looking for, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. So look, if we're running to receive a paycheck, we're running for the wrong reason. If we're running to receive praise of men, we're running for the wrong reason. If we're running so we can, I don't know, make the brethren happy, we're running for the wrong reason. We're running because we're looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Verse number 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we and incorruptible. incorruptible. Now temperate means to be, uh, it means to have self-control and self-discipline. And so you and I are to have our, our body under subjection. In fact, to be temperate, or temperance, we should say, is a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, faith, temperance. I get them all, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Now, this verse also mentions the incor incorruptible crown, and that crown is for keeping one's body under subjection. There are five crowns. We mentioned those in a previous lesson could mention them again here. We didn't have them on the test the last time. They could be next time. Verse 26, the Bible says, I therefore, for, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now listen, we need to keep this flesh under control. Man, if we don't, we'll become a statistic, a has-been, 
or a castaway. Here's a couple of ways that can happen. Not heeding spiritual direction and going worldly or by wearing out and dying prematurely. This is the case of many preachers in the ministry. Either way, God help us to keep this old body of ours under subjection to the Bible of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, we thank you. Thank you that you have given us your word. We don't have to rely upon the accolades of men. We have a Bible. What a blessing. Pray you'd help us to apply these truths to our heart and our life. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. All right, our prayer can name last week was David Bowman, not the missionary. <clears throat> Although you can pray for the missionary, David Bowman. I'm sure he would 